Hey guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out today. We're really grateful for you tuning in. And if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully you have subscribed so that you never miss an episode. But if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com or whatever it is you're listening to this podcast on and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We are bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership. If you like the conversations in these podcasts, then I want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about over on the ATA website. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalogue of previous web classes, plus a huge library of videos and projects to problem solve different training situations and we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private facebook group forums area and whatsapp chat groups it's like a netflix social media platform for animal behavior nerds but we will get started on today's episode which isn't just any old episode we are celebrating approximations today as we record what is going to be episode 100 of the ata podcast show And I remember when I first started this show, I thought 100 episodes seemed like a nice number to try and achieve. And three and a half years later, here we are. We have traveled around the world in that time, speaking to the world's most proficient animal training and behavior professionals from a large number of different industries, working with an extensive amount of different species, and most importantly, all singing the same song, striving to work with our learners in the most positive and least intrusive ways. So who better to join me today than the word wizard behind those four words, most positive, least intrusive, which have helped guide me for the past decade and helped guide so many others around the world, Dr. Susan Friedman herself, who is patiently waiting by. Susan, hello, welcome, and thank you so much for being our special guest on episode 100 of the show. It's really wonderful to hear that of all the words that I've said in the three and a half years since you've been doing this, um, you picked most positive, least intrusive. And I'm so happy that it's um, associated with me. But I'll tell you that it's a much bigger concept, those four words, most positive, least intrusive, than um, anything I've come up with. It's uh, part of our special education um, ethical standard and part of our legal standard to protect children uh, to the most positive, least intrusive learning environments. So connecting the dots from children learners to other non-human learners was a very short step for me. The concept of intrusiveness is also um, part of the medical community's standard, and you also see it in uh, discussions about the law. So it's an interesting concept that it has such widespread applicability. And it's it's but it's guided me since uh, I think I'm going to say it guided me since 2010 when we met so nearly a decade, uh, and you, you were saying how neat it is that here we are today recording this after nearly a decade has passed, and and I think one thing that you said back then and one thing that you mentioned briefly before we pushed record today is that we used to say changing the world one person at a time, but <laughs> with these podcast episodes now we can do it uh, thousands of people at a time. Yeah, you and I were comparing the number of countries that we've had um, influence that we've taught in, whether it's through podcasts or through Living and Learning with Animals, my online course that I started around 2001 in one form or another. So that's almost 20 years. And um, I've I've, uh, had students from about 35 countries. And then you and I looked at the map that you have where people have listened to your podcasts. And there was many more countries where people have listened than where people have not. And I I just think this is an amazing, uh, amazing amount of influence for people who just sort of 
felt a mission to contribute in some positive and lasting way. So I congratulate you. I, I'm just over the moon excited for the success you've had in disseminating this incredible, empowering information. Yeah, thank you. And I, and I like looking at that list and, you know, moving my mouse around and seeing all of the different countries and then maybe, for example, moving it over Philippines and then just imagining someone like walking down the main street of Manila or the main street, <laughs> walking down somewhere in the, <laughs> in the city of Manila and uh, all the hustle and bustle going on around them. But in their ears, they're listening to uh, Ryan Cartledge and Dr. Susan Friedman talk about <laughs> uh, most positive, least intrusive. That, that's a pretty, um, I don't know, that, that, that thought gets me all warm and fuzzy inside. Let's put it that way. <laughs> it does. It's very humbling. And it's also, um, I don't, not intimidating. I just feel that we also, with the the contact, the connection we have with people through the internet and in our live work as well, that um, it carries a big responsibility with it. So I'm always reading articles. You should see what my desk looks like. There's two stacks of books and papers everywhere. It really represents the responsibility I feel we have that once we make those connections, we continue to study, to learn, to train, to gain more experience, um, to make our circle of influencers bigger and find more mentors for ourselves to be able to carry the responsibility of helping people stay current and, um, you know, contemporary and to continue to reduce intrusiveness. Um, where intrusiveness means something very specific, it means um, the degree to which the learner has control within any learning experience. So great things have happened in my nearly 20 years of working with animal behavior and learning. Um, things I never imagined would be improved on. And maybe that's the biggest lesson I've had in, in this endeavor is that we continue to improve procedures um, and continue to get both the application and the research moving forward in ways that reduce aversive stimulation and increase the animal's control over their outcomes. So it's very exciting. Yeah, and I feel like doing this podcast uh, every year, I kind of look back 12 months ago at, at what I thought I knew. <laughs> Uh, or, right. or my understanding of behavior and when oh my like it's phenomenal how much uh, I think my thinking evolves over a year and I can only imagine for you because I think you yeah. like, you do it on like a completely different level than, <laughs> than I do it yeah I don't know that it's a, a different level but I'm I'm definitely in contact with the academic world um, to some degree. You know, I work hard to stay connected to anything new coming from um, the research world. And I'm lucky enough to work with other people who have contact in the academic world. So I learn more from them. Um, and then I'm out there, you know, observing people training and learning from trainers themselves all the time. It's it's a phenomenal pace with which I feel like we are improving what we do, um, which was a big improvement back then from the cultural fog. You know, we had so much to offer 20 years ago that allowed learners to be more empowered. To take these next steps forward to increase that empowerment is, I have to admit, a bit of a surprise to me and really exciting. And when we were preparing for this episode, you said to me, you mentioned that to me, you said you've learned a lot since we last spoke uh, and mentioned there's been some innovations towards less intrusive procedures, which in your words, uh, have sparked a new wave of twists. Yeah. Can you speak to what these are and what you've been learning slash thinking about recently with regards to us moving towards even less intrusive procedures? Yeah, you know, it starts with asking the right questions, being a good observer and letting what you observe move you to ask the right questions. You can't find answers for questions you haven't asked yet. And maybe that's obvious for people, but it's the way that I've been thinking this through as I'm watching a new wave of improved applications of our basic principles. So for example, one remaining area that is intrusive for animals that 
I've had my eye on and and I think we as a community have had our eyes on is extinction. Extinction, the withholding of reinforcers that had been maintaining a behavior um, is an area that's problematic from a least intrusive goal sense. So we can look at our use of extinction when we put a behavior on cue. We usually toggle between offered instances that no longer get reinforced and cued instances that we will continue to reinforce. And we use extinction in shaping traditionally when we think about reinforcing a current approximation and extinguishing the prior approximations that is not reinforcing them. And a third place that we use extinction is in differential reinforcement of alternative behaviors and all of those variations, alternative, incompatible, high rates, low rates, etc. When we reinforce the alternative behavior and withhold reinforcement, extinguish the problem behavior. So those are three procedures that we're all using all the time when we're teaching, cueing, shaping, and reducing problem behaviors with alternative behaviors. Um, and, And so extinction is very prevalent in our work. And yet, when I think about the experience of having a history of reinforcement that is then turned off, that tap is turned off, um, I'm aware that that's an area where we could dive in and um, see if we can't reduce the use of it. So if our goal is reducing the use of extinction, we have to explore all the creative ways that we can um, get our teaching outcomes, our successes, other ways. And as I start looking for that, I'm seeing that many other people in our community are doing that work. And it's both at the uh, research community, where I have three studies here I printed out just to be able to show you that are all exploring um, uh, ways of uh, reducing extinction in teaching in the use of differential reinforcement. And um, I have other examples of, uh, for exa- example, Alexandra Curlin talks about, and, and others talk about uh, having the cue emerge from the shaping process. So there isn't such a marked shift from reinforcing offered behaviors to now only reinforcing cued behaviors. Um, Other people, uh, many people are talking about training in pairs. So again, Alexandra and Sarah Owings and um, Hannah um, Brannigan and others have talked about reducing the use of extinction by shaping in pairs so that if you shape a forward step for reinforcement, you might also reinforce a backward step and then you can toggle between those two to get them on cue. Um, And another example is uh, one I pointed you to, you may have already been there, is Mary Hunter's beautiful website called uh, Behavior Explorers, where she's put up some excellent videos to show some of the exploration of techniques and improvements on techniques for training um, using the portal, um, the portal platform to discover new strategies. And uh, were you able to look at the one where she discusses and demonstrates building duration? Yeah, by check, check that teaching out. a chain. Uh, it, ex- it was very exciting to watch. Right. So the application of these things that all of these wonderful thinkers and doers, these innovators is what they are, um, is the, the practical applications are just phenomenal. They're infinite. Uh, for example, we used uh, the technique that Ma- that Mary demonstrated, one I hadn't thought of, was for building duration, which can be a very difficult thing to train, is to keep doing what you're doing 
through time? How do we convey that we're not looking for you to change what you do um, in the silence of no reinforcement? We want you to continue doing what you do. And duration is not particularly well described in textbooks. You know, I have so many special education textbooks and learning and behavior textbooks. And duration is just not a characteristic that is particularly focused on. So to see Mary focus on it was really filling a void for me. And the way that she did it was, shall I explain? Is this a good time? Or it's not a tangent, okay? Um, I'm just so enamored of these innovators. Um, What she did was she taught a two-link chain, a two-behavior chain. So you cue the first behavior and reinforce it, and then cue the second behavior and reinforce it. And do that sequence until the animal has, or the learner has good experience with the cue, behavior reinforce, new cue, behavior reinforce in this two behavior sequence. And then to build duration on the first behavior, she demonstrated simply delaying the cue for the second behavior. The animal has a history of hearing the cue and responding for the second behavior. And so they keep doing what they were doing, behavior one, waiting for the cue for behavior two. And by delaying the cue for behavior two, you can start to build duration. So I immediately saw, uh, you know, dozens of applications for this. For example, we have a new just year old pup whose name is Ray, and he goes to the door and barks to be let outside. And he's been barking louder and longer. So what we did was use that approach. We watch him go to the door and he barks. We respond really quickly by opening the door. Right at the very first utterance, the first inkling of that bark, we get up, open the door, and we've done that for a few dozen times. So now he barks and he looks for us to get up to open the door. And we've just delayed that wait time for us to get to the door to open it. And as a result, he's learned to make a small, quiet bark and then wait for us to go to the door. And the wait is up to about 15 15 to 30 seconds. So that, for me, is really a great behavior. You want to go outside, you make a vocalization that's uh, low decibels and short, and and then you wait. Um, And so we got the duration of waiting at the door in that way by having the second Um, QB getting up to go open the door. So there's endless ways that we could apply this for the animals we live with and for the animals um, that we help people work with. Um, So your dog's at the door. First behavior is dog barks, which you immediately reinforced to start with by getting up and going and opening the door and allowing access to outside. Then the second behavior was wait and look for you. So you got barking then a momentary pause and look for you at which point you immediately reinforce that and then you just increase the duration of the waiting and looking for you is that correct yeah the that's one way to look at it and maybe we've got a three sequence three behavior sequence or how we divide it um is up to us uh, as long as it's useful so he barks i say hang on ray get up quickly open the door So if we wrote down, let's see, he barks, I'm going to do an ABC because I didn't prepare an ABC assessment, but I can see that that'll help us clarify. We could say that the hang on reinforces the bark and is the antecedent for standing at the door. Standing at the door is reinforced by it opening, and it's also the antecedent for going outside, reinforced by yard access. So what I delayed was opening the door so that I lengthened the second behavior, duration, standing at the door. So person comes up driveway, dog barks, you say, hang on. The consequence then becomes the antecedent for the dog to wait. The wait gets reinforced by the door opening. The door opening is a new antecedent for the behavior of running through the door in order to get access to the yard. If there's a 15 to 30 second delay in there, does there there get more ABCs added in there as they have to wait or not? That's a great question. My answer is that How refined we analyze, how micro we get in our analysis is guided by how useful 
uh, more micro or less micro view is. So we can add ABCs or not. Uh, we can get really minuscule or not, depending on what information we're looking for. So while he's standing at the door waiting for me to get up to open it, that's where I wanted duration. So rather than put ABCs there, I've just, I'm just i counting that as duration of the second behavior, standing at the door with mouth closed. And that duration is going to be increased by delaying the cue for the third behavior, which is going through the door. So we have three behaviors, barking, standing at the door with his mouth closed, and going through the door. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to delay going through the door in order to get duration on the standing. Now, what you're asking is, can we put in more ABCs during the standing? But I don't think we need to because this level of assessment gives me the information I'm looking for. We could describe my getting up and going to the door, but that level of granularity, that's the word I was groping for, that level of granularity doesn't give me more information. It, it, it's too granular. It becomes hard to see the main milestones of this run. For me, someone else might want it more granular. Someone else might want it more macro. But now that we've talked it through together, What's useful for me is to think about the barking, the standing at the door, and the going through the door. And what I want is to increase the standing at the door's duration. So I, I delay by small increments opening the door, getting up to open the door. We want to be careful that the ABCs are not, functional assessment is not a time log of events as they occur. It's not a time log where we would sit there and write down everything that is happening in the order of events that it happened. That kind of approach, that narrative approach, is a different kind of, of data taking. The ABCs are not a time log. They are the antecedent that signals do the behavior now and the consequence that maintains the behavior in the future next time that antecedent occurs, that signal occurs. So it's a level of analysis that is not moment by moment description of events as the behavior and environment interact in the stream that we're watching passing by. It's more of a picking out of the stream the most relevant, useful, environment, behavior, environment relations. We ask what signals the behavior now and what consequence reinforces it, maintains it. And then anything more granular between those three events may or may not be helpful. So if I were to do a time-based recording, a logging approach, I would be writing down every little thing and how it moved the environment and then how the environment moved every little thing and how every little thing moved the environment. That's not what uh, a functional assessment is about. It's about answering really those three questions. What's the behavior in observable terms? What's the signal for the behavior? And what's the maintaining consequence? So when I ask what's the behaviors I'm interested in, in this example, it's barking, standing at the door with mouth closed and going through the door, then I go back in and I ask, what are the antecedent cues that set the behavior in play? And what are the reinforcers that maintain it? That's how I come up with this level of granularity. Someone comes up the driveway, the dog barks. I reinforce that one utterance, a soft bark by saying, hang on, hang on cues standing at the door while I get up and open it. Opening the door, signals go through it, maintained by yard access. And then I delayed the opening the door, the getting up and opening the door, um, in order to get more duration of the quiet standing at the door. And that relates to what I saw in Mary Hunter's demonstration on Behavior Explorer of delaying the cue for the second behavior in her two behavior sequence in order to get more duration on the first behavior. That's that's really helpful, and I haven't really uh, had or heard someone explain ABCs with regards to them not being moment by moment descriptions, but 
uh, more of picking out of the stream the most relevant and useful uh, information. I think my brain's already always gone to kind of um, moment by moment descriptions. Uh, you know, so this this podcast and this recording today has um, provided me information to uh, change the way I look at that moving forward. So thank you for that. That was an unexpected rabbit hole that I think is, is going to be beneficial <laughs> to uh, everyone listening. Because yeah. because what we were talking about uh, is the changes that you've seen or all the twists that you're seeing that are um, moving towards li- more. <laughs> this is a weird combination of words. More <laughs> less intrusive <laughs> methods. Um, you said earlier you can't find answers for questions that you haven't asked yet um, and so so what <laughs> this is another weird combination of words what questions don't you think we've asked yet like what what questions are you what other questions or have you already answered that question are you kind of thinking about moving forward over the coming years how can how can we find these questions what are these questions yeah, I think they come from uh, good observation skills paired with the commitment to improving the quality of life of our learners. So we can watch sort of a more traditional uh, differential reinforcement approach. Um, for example, putting a behavior on cue, you reinforce the behavior in that BC loop. Um, Again, that Alexandra talks about the BC loop. And then once the animal is offering the behavior uh, without hesitation and you're reinforcing it and and getting a good fluent loop, then you traditionally would put it on cue by withholding reinforcement for those offered behaviors and only reinforce uh, cued instances. And we watch animals experience that shift from having every behavior reinforced in the BC loop as the game is changed to adding a cue. So then we can ask the question, well, that animal has to go through a lot of unreinforced effort offering behavior that had been reinforced just moments ago in order to learn that now that's no longer going to be reinforced, only cued instances are going to be reinforced. So when we observe that use of extinction, we can then say, I wonder if there aren't ways to reduce that. And here are some of the great ways that people have done that. So we're um, Alexandra Curlin and uh, Sarah Owings and Hannah Brannigan and I are going to talk about some of these different approaches to putting behavior on cue that minimize the use of extinction, the sort of standard differential reinforcement, reinforce cued instances and extinguish uncued instances um, at Clicker Expo this year. So I'll give a shout out for that presentation because we've, um, the four of us already talked about it quite a bit. And it's just another example of people asking the right question. How can I reduce the use of extinction so that the animal has a more positive experience learning to respond to a cue for reinforcement? Yeah. Another area is um, the studies that are looking at Um, comparing stimulus-stimulus pairing versus response-stimulus pairing to teach behavior. So that Pavlovian procedure of stimulus-stimulus pairing versus the Skinnerian procedure of response consequence BC, SS versus BC. There are some new articles out and trainers, I've observed those innovators Um, comparing those two procedures and starting to uh, find new ways to to teach behavior. Um, So an example of that, I learned from Kiki Yablon, who is one of my um, co-instructors for LLA and a behavior consultant, a dog behavior consultant, who I always learn a lot from. And she's very generous with her time, as are the other people I've men- mentioned, which is why I'm able to harvest their innovations and consider them from a science point of view and uh, more applications. Um, she described for me teaching the station behavior, teaching a dog to go to a mat, Um, with initially a stimulus-stimulus pairing procedure, which she then leveraged into an ABC, an operant procedure. So it looks like this. And I did it just the other day with my daughter's little dog, Ruby, who looks quite a lot like Phoebe. 
We wanted to teach Ruby to go to the mat when cued to station, go to the mat. And so what I did was I started with just stimulus, stimulus pairing. I just said station and I dropped food on the mat, independent of anything she was doing. So of course she saw me drop the food on the mat. So she came to the mat and ate the food. And I repeated, I threw food off the mat to reset. Station, drop food. She came and ate the food. I threw food again off the mat to get her to reset. And I did dozens of these saying the word station and dropping food. That is the pairing of the word station and food, independent of what she did, dozens of times. So that now when I said station and held back dropping the food, She ran over to the mat and then I dropped the food. Boom, now I'm into ABCs. Threw food away to reset it. Station, ran to the mat, dropped the food, and there we were. So another variation of this might have been the stimulus-stimulus pairing, saying station and dropping food, and when she came to get the food, dropping another piece. So that I've got a stimulus-stimulus pairing thing going on, and a reinforcing going to the mat thing going on at the same time. And then you just fade the non-contingent food drop and clean up that ABC. So if we were to do an ABC assessment on that, not a time log, but an ABC assessment, our goal, ABC, is to say station, have her run to the mat, and then reinforce that behavior. The food is contingent on going to the mat. But I started by just saying station and dropping food repeatedly. Then I just missed one beat. I said station held the food, she came over, and then I dropped it. And then we can put repetitions on that. Now, people, I'm sure so many of you wonderful trainers have been doing that forever. And I'm probably the slow one to say, wait, what was that? But these, for me, are innovations from traditional uses or applications of our principles. So either I'm leading the way by describing these things, or I'm catching up with the innovators who have been doing it for a long time. Either role is fine with me, but it's unbelievably reinforcing to be working with all of you to see these things and um, then say, well, what's the behavior analysis language for that? Um, We've got a stimulus-stimulus pairing procedure. We've got a response stimulus or ABC procedure. And we're sort of bringing them together in a way that reduces the use of extinction and increases the rate of reinforcement. And so observation and then observation leading to asking questions about how can we if we if we ever we are observing extinction then asking questions how can we potentially do this in a different way where the animal doesn't have to have the tap turned off that's right and you know it sounds familiar to me because we did this with punishment our key question with punishment was not is it effective it is is it necessary And when we ask that key question, is it necessary, that opens the door to innovations. Well, maybe I can teach that animal to do that behavior less and do this one instead more without punishment. What would that look like? What principles can I bring to bear on that? And of course, that's what differential reinforcement of incompatible behavior addresses. And um, so it's, it's reminiscent to me of so many decades ago asking that important question, can we teach with less punishment? And that led to DRI and to errorless learning and to many, many of the innovations then that are just part and parcel of our toolbox now. And now I'm seeing that question, is it necessary? Yes, it's traditional, but is it necessary to use that much extinction to get a behavior on cue or to shape a new behavior. Um, Is it necessary? Is it effective? Clearly. But is it necessary? Well, what can we do differently to make the rate of reinforcement higher, to make the emotional experience less frustrating, more comfortable for for the animal? And that's what I think we're doing now. And that's why I'm so jazzed about it is this new wave of asking the next level 
is it necessary? The next level of intrusiveness, is that necessary? Or can we turn that down, that dial down as well? Like we've done so successfully turning the dial down with punishment. Can we now turn the dial down with extinction? This is really cool. And that's getting Susan jazzed in. It's uh, definitely something that everyone here is going to be jazzed <laughs> about as well. Um, so yeah, we're asking the question, is it necessary? And uh, one thing I want to leverage, the, the short time we have left on this podcast to uh, pick your brains on uh, is if we are engaging in these conversations with others who might say it is necessary, uh, how, what, what's your offering uh, from all you've learned over the years with regards to being in this community that we have uh, and having these conversations with each other, um, y- you are a big advocate of, as am I, crucial conversations. You know, what, what does this bring to our community uh, to influence people, also people outside of the community? Um, what, what can you offer the listeners just quickly at the end of this podcast episode uh, in 2019 about how we can better engage with each other uh, if we if we engage in conversations where people might not necessarily agree with this? Yeah, I, I, I think that um, along with the key question, is it necessary, is the other key question, which is, what does it look like? Tell me what that looks like. So when people say punishment is necessary or that's not good welfare for the animal or, you know, these kinds of um, issues that we don't all agree with take many forms. Uh, Training is unkind to animals or, yeah, all the different ways that people assert that what we're advocating is insufficient in some way. I ask, tell me what the measure of the insufficiency is. What What's the measure? What does the measure look like? So if someone were to say uh, punishment is necessary, I'm trying with crucial conversation skills to mine what is it that is the measure they're using. So if they say, well, you couldn't teach a dog to wait quietly at the door without jerking its collar then I can say, well, what's the measure? What does waiting quietly at the door look like? And if I can show you that I can do that behavior with another procedure, then, you know, will that be useful for you? Or if someone says, you know, that training is um, demeaning to animals, then I can say, you know, what, what does a demeaned animal look like? What is the measure of demeaning an animal? And without a measure, we can't really pursue those disagreements. So the form, co- the form of the question changes, but it's always about, you know, what, what would it look like for an animal be, to be demeaned? What is the measure? And then when we look, do we see that? So if an animal's welfare is compromised um, by training, what does compromised welfare look like? And do we see it? And I think so what I'm scratching at the surface of, I guess, is the importance of data to back up what our assertions are about what we think is good or bad, ethical or not ethical, intrusive or unintrusive, positive or negative. All of those debates in their many forms really are only going to be addressed by operationalizing what behavior it is we would see and then looking setting up our environments to see whether we get it. Is that is that helpful? <laughs> well, you ask you always ask me really hard questions, I'll, so I'm never sure. Well, I was going to say one thing that you said there was you could frame it to the other person. Will will that be useful for you if I show you this way? I'm just uh, I, I feel like the challenge, the challenge, the the challenge people have, <laughs> the challenge people have. How this has gone way way meta than I think we're actually talking about. A challenge I see people have uh, is knowing where to go when they feel observable behaviours, such as an increased heart rate or tensing of calf muscles, uh, whatever it might be that <laughs> they might label as angry or uh, getting a strong emotion. Um, so, so are you suggesting in that space, when we're talking about animals and ethics with others in 2019, we, we are reaching for that question, what does that look like? 
with regards to crucial conversations and engaging? Or what's the measure? I think when you, let's just go where where you're leading about the emotions of the negative emotions that are often um, coinciding with trying to convince somebody that they can use less intrusive procedures than they use. And um, I think what happens, I think Crucial Conversations really covers a lot of ground here. It's amazing to me. Um, But when we feel those things, dry mouth, blood pressure getting higher, heart rate soaring, tension in our muscles, things that we call angry in that context that our reinforcers have changed and we're not even aware of it. So being mindful of what is your, what is the outcome you're engaging in this discussion for? And when we feel anger, I have to ask, what's the reinforcer? Is it, is it that you want to be right? Do you want to change the other person's mind through intimidation? Do you want to, at what cost Uh, to the relationship? Would you continue a discussion that is not meeting your goal of educating them? It starts to be about other reinforcers. And I think we need to be aware when we shift from our goal to some other goal and that that explains why we get into these head-butting, uncomfortable, negative, emotional experiences with people. If if someone doesn't want to change their mind, then why would I be having the conversation trying to change their mind? So I think we have to go into those conversations agreeing that we want to hear what the other person has to say and they want to hear what we want to say before we embark on the path that gets us to the impasse, the headbutting and the anger. So to say to somebody, When I watch how you've trained that, it brings to mind some alternatives that leave that animal with more choice without compromising the learning objective. Would you be interested in talking about that? And if they're not, then I would I would not pursue that. I would leave the bridge open. If you start to think about it and muse about it, if ever you want to pursue that with me, I'm always available. I'm game. And I'm going to do a ping pong around (laughs) the subject. Uh, So we might be uh, jumping to the other side of the table here. But just something I've been playing in my mind that relates to this. Um, And and let me me say what I mean when I say this. (laughs) My interpretation of everything you just offered. Uh, is to remind ourselves when we're about to engage in those conversations what we're, what the outcome is that we're actually trying to achieve with this person in front of us uh, as opposed to being right or being wrong or trying to force our opinion on someone. Um, you worded a similar train of thought in an email to me is to have strong opinions, we have to commit to strong learning. What, what does that mean when we're <laughs> engaging with others? How does that fall into this conversation we're currently having? It falls in really well. You're, you're doing a great job of connecting dots that were not obvious to me. Um, what I see is people having those strong opinions about what they're doing is, is right. And so another one of these key questions, so this is our third or our fourth, right? Um, one of our key questions was, what does it look like? What's the measure? Um, with this key question that comes to mind, it's how do you know that? Because that's different than my experience. That's different than the information I'm carrying. So let's put the information into the common pool. Tell me, what brought you to that conclusion? One of the ones that I always, um, I'm always cheeky about is when people tell me where they disagree with Skinner. And this happens from lay people to experts, you know. Um, Pinker, the Crucial Conversations guys themselves, Granny, says in the book that he disagrees with Skinner. It's a very common thing for me to hear and to read. And I, I always think to myself, that's interesting. I wonder what books of Skinner they have read. Where, what is their information? What is it that you disagree with? And so often when I pursue that, it's a misunderstanding. It's something someone believed Skinner to have said or written about, and, and he didn't. Or often people will say, well, I've never really read anything. And so I'll say, well, you know, then you want to think twice, 
can I recommend a book for you um, about phrasing your disagreement in that way? So those, those are the kinds of examples that lead me to say that to have strong opinions about what is the right way to do things, to train an animal, what is the wrong way, what is the right way to present a show or the wrong way, what is the right messaging or the right way to teach a client who has behavior problems at home with a dog. Um, or a kid. To hold strong opinions, you need to constantly, we need to constantly be asking ourselves, where do these strong opinions come from? Can we back them up? If someone questions us politely, can we give them the information that brought us to hold these strong opinions? To have strong opinions without that hard work and backup, I think is um, a failure of duty. It's a failure of duty of the leaders of, of strong opinions. Yeah. So it's for ourselves to remind ourselves that we have to do the hard work and the homework. Uh, the Getting the facts is the, the homework for crucial conversations, you might say. Uh, but is, is it also to help guide us to the right questions when we're hearing a strong opinion from someone else? I think so, to ask them, how, how, do, how do you know that? I think it's a fair question. I think we have to spend time figuring out ways of asking it so that it's not provoking someone. Well, how do you know that is very different than saying, that's interesting. I got, and I got this phrase from a veterinarian and trainer, Susan Brown. Um, she said to me, I ask, I say, not in my experience. That's interesting. That's not my experience. Tell me how you know that. I think that's a wonderful way to phrase it in a less provocative tone is to say, oh, that's interesting. In my understanding of Skinner, I haven't come across that. Can you tell me where you have? And it's for me. Everything that I say is equally for me as it is advice for anyone else. You know, that's the beauty of teaching is you really get to examine your own biases, misinformation. You put yourself out there on that limb and welcome students to question you. That keeps sending you back to the books, back to the articles, back to Google Scholar, back to your mentors. I remember talking about, um, for example, negative reinforcement producing only enough behavior to escape the aversive stimulus and not having the enthusiasm to seek to produce super criterion that positive reinforcement does. And, and I was in a room with 500 people when I said that and somebody raised their hand and said, how do you know that? What's the research to support that? For me, that had been axiomatic. I had heard that throughout my 40 plus years of career in teaching with positive reinforcement. Um, but I didn't have a research study or a textbook to respond. So I simply said, and many of your listeners have heard me say, I'll get back to you on that. I, I don't know. I, don't, I can't think of where that came from, but I will find out. And so I started researching and I found Aubrey Daniels in organizational behavior management, and he coined the term discretionary effort. And then that led me back through some line of research. But if that participant had not asked, how do you know that? I would know less. And so I've learned to appreciate and open those doors to be questioned because I will only end up not knowing one time and then I'll go find the information. And now that's an area I can respond to. I'm smarter for it. So that's part of um, my advice to me and to all of, all of us in our community as it regards disagreement is to ask people, that's not our experience how, what is your experience? How do you know that? And then together we can pursue information to back up whatever assertions we're holding or to let go of assertions that don't hold up. So quick question. I feel like you're good at this. Like we can fire a question at you and um, you can, uh, as this vet did, sorry, I forget her name, um, Say Susan, Susan Brown. Brown. Say, and not in my experience. Yeah, tell me how you uh, came to have this belief. Uh, and for me, in my experience, I've written those things down, and then I've gone back to them when I find myself in a crucial conversation, and I remind myself of these helpful ways of saying things uh, tentatively. What What's your method for kind of 
do you have one? Maybe you don't have an intentional method of incorporating these responses into the way you communicate with others. Does that make sense, that question? Yeah. Um, do I have, uh, w- what is my sort of uh, bag of tricks that help me maintain uh, this approach to interacting around disagreement? Yeah. I think you have so many different things come together. One thing is to go back to that idea of what is your reinforcer? Is your reinforcer to change their mind or to understand where they're coming from? I think the reinforcer understanding where they're coming from is going to be a much more useful, serviceable reinforcer. So I remind myself that it's not really to change their mind. It's to understand where they're coming from. And if they hold the same value of understanding where I'm coming from, both of our minds may change in some way. That's beneficial for animals who we're teaching. So I'm, I'm very aware of having the reinforcer for the person I'm talking to or not having any reinforcers. And I'm very aware of what their reinforcers are for me. So I think about that. It's just another way of asking, why am I engaging in this conversation? What outcome will be of value to me? And being clear that maybe it isn't about changing somebody's mind today. Maybe the approximation for today is simply understanding what information they're working from. What's their point of view, you know? And if I only go in to change their mind, then I don't ask the questions that reveal their point of view. And I end up knowing less. And that's a punisher for me. Knowing less is a punisher. So I do the things that put me in position to garner more from them. And and I see that as an approximation towards the ultimate goal of having them use punishment less and reinforcement more. So again, it goes back to all of those books about communication. They're all really saying the same. They too are singing the same song, just in different keys, whether it's crucial conversation or the power of trust or... Um, making winning friends and losing enemies or, you know, there's hundreds of them. They're all very similar in that they advise that we should um, learn ways to get information into the common pool. And coercing someone into changing their mind is not the same as getting information into the common pool. So I think one of the one of the tips I can offer is to really be analytical about what your reinforcers are, what are your what's your goal and what are the approximations to get to the goal so that even when changing someone's mind is our ultimate goal we have approximations to go through and protecting the communication is the number one immediate goal in any conversation protecting the relationship being able to talk another day Maybe we'll call this episode that. Protecting the communication is the number one goal. And yeah. remembering that understanding is a possible approximation in your interaction with the individual in front of you. Whew. Absolutely. Every, every principle we have in behavior analysis is so relevant to our daily interactions with one another. You know, what are the approximations to changing somebody's mind? And then let's walk through them. Certainly one of the early ones has to be letting them feel safe enough to give us their point of view and sharing ours. That's got to be on the earlier approximations list. And changing someone's mind, giving them our point of view and asking them to let go of theirs is a really long, long path. It's not a short, quick path. But if they're not feeling safe, my my reminder is if we don't have respect or mutual purpose or trust, then there's not really much point in me trying to share my uh, opinion because it's potentially going to be met with uh, a frame of why is this person doing this to manipulate me or their, their, their uh, motive isn't um, genuine. So I love that. That was awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. These are really hard things to to do, hard skills to build and and we spend a lifetime building them. It's not some there's no it's not like criterion reference, you know, you learn how to add double digit numbers and you can do 50 in a minute and so you've passed off. This is just something that we do by increments our entire life. 
I would dare say it's what our lives are for, figuring out how to communicate these ways. And um, I often say that it's much more like a butterfly. You know, it 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 lights onto your hand. You you feel that groove. You've succeeded in having that kind of conversation with someone, and then it flies away. And you feel anger, and you feel upset, and you're not effective. And then you work at it some more, and and it lights on your hand again. It's much more elusive than other skill sets we have, probably because the demands of the context are so variable. You know, it's hard to come prepared for all the different ways the environment changes, the conditions change over these debates and disagreements. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes it's good to just recognize that the anger that you feel is really a reflection of how much you care. You know, to say to somebody, we need to park this I'm feeling angry and I don't want you to misunderstand. The anger is not at you. It's it's really the emotion that's tracking how deeply it matters to me, how deeply you matter to me. So we're going to park it today. You know, I remember saying to my children very often in disagreements, you know, this is what love looks like. If I wasn't discussing this with you with this much passion and disagreement, I wouldn't be the parent that I hope to be. So... By analogy, you know, the emotions that you feel are can be seen as tracking the measure of caring and not the measure of disgust at somebody or disappointment at somebody. Yeah. The anger that you feel is really a reflection of how much you care. Yeah. And it's not saying that we we should, um, uh, you know, we should seek to be angry. But I'm if I didn't care about you, I wouldn't, you would not have the capacity to elicit those emotions. If I didn't care about the topic, I wouldn't feel that way. I wouldn't feel anger. So in an odd way, it's a measure of your caring when you feel angry with me. It just is not helpful to meeting our end goal, which is sharing our points of view. (laughs) The, uh, longevity of this podcast episode is a reflection of how much we care about the subject we're talking about today but looking at the time it does mean that we should probably end towards probably head towards uh, wrapping this up um, Susan I've got a huge list of things that I wanted to talk about today but I'm glad that we talked about the things we did because it's been learning opportunities for me and I'm sure there's going to be a ton of learning opportunities for the listeners of this show as well as we move forward to uh, spread ripples as we say at Animal Training Academy and, and we move towards more positive less intrusive uh, ways of working with our animals, our let's just say our learners. Uh, after April 2019, when we hung out in Australia, I now say earthlings <laughs> when people ask me what we teach. Um, can we just finish the episode off by you directing people to where they can go to uh, learn more, uh, get in touch, learn more, and get in touch? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, to get in touch with me, I'm happy for people to email at sgfriedman at icloud.com. And Friedman is F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N. Um, everything uh, at behaviorworks.org is available to people to download, to distribute, to use. Um, if you want to edit any of it, just contact me and we can work on that together. There's graphics and articles translated into 13 or 14 different languages. People are welcome to take everything from there. Um, yeah, and uh, to learn more uh, about the things we've talked about and different applications, there's the Living and Learning with Animals course that I'm now teaching twice a year, uh, August and January. And then there are all the many mentors that are too too many to mention. But, you know, Steve Martin has a wonderful website with great articles and amazing trainers. Um, and Alexandra Kurland has a great podcast, uh, as does Hannah Brannigan. Um, Clicker Expo is a fabulous place to learn more. I learn so much every year. So, you know, keep on looking and learning and teaching. I think that's that's really the trio is um, you're not just learners, you're teachers. We are all learners and teachers at once. And and so enjoy that that position to keep adding more and influencing more. Wonderful. This has been uh, so much fun, Susan. I'm thrilled that we had this opportunity to do this uh, for the 100th episode. And I personally had the opportunity to do this for the 100th time. 
Amazing. Absolutely amazing, Zip. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, we'll see if we can get to 200 now, I guess. I thought maybe when we got to 100, I might stop, but uh, this is way too reinforcing for me to uh, consider that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't stop now. So 200, and I'll meet you there. Here we go. So three and a half years to get here. So in 2022, uh, we'll... Uh, Hold you to that. <laughs> I've got I've got it on my calendar. <laughs> hey, like I said, mega appreciated you taking time to come and hang out with us today, Susan. Thank you so much. My pleasure, and um, best best wishes wishes and great respect to all of you listeners. Definitely, we appreciate. Talk to you. Sorry, soon. You, final words. Say it. You had one more thing to say. Of just great respect and admiration. I hope we all meet on the path soon. (laughs) We do appreciate all of you tuning in today and over the last three and a half years as well. Uh, If you've enjoyed this episode and you are interested in carrying on the conversation about working with animals in the most positive, funnest, choice, rich, least intrusive ways, get curious, ask more questions, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the ATA community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the social media Netflix platform for behavior geeks there's something there for absolutely everyone we're really looking forward to having you join our tribe that's it for this episode though we're going to wrap it up there thanks again so much everyone for listening like i said today and over the years you'll hear from us again soon